Good afternoon, everybody. This is Susan Ganation, the CMO of ClareBridge, and today we are very excited to bring you this webinar with Jay Baer. Um, back in 2013, I had the fortune of meeting Jay at an event called Social Media Marketing World, which is held every year in San Diego. It's a fantastic event, but um, this one was special to me because it introduced me to Jay for the first time. Um, he, at the time, had released a book called Utility. Uh, that book is, is extremely um, smart and motivating, and it really inspired me in my career um, to want to help people do their jobs better. Um, so our goal at ClareBridge, based on that idea of being useful to others, is to help you improve your customer experience management programs. And to that end, we deliver a number of resources to you, ebooks, advice columns, blogs, white papers. In addition, we bring you webinars, and this is just one of the webinars in that series. But this is, of course, a very special one because today, Jay Bear, who, uh, by the way, has worked with more than 700 brands since 1994, including brands like the United Nations, Nike, Costco, Allstate, and many other large organizations. Um, Jay has been working on um, and talking about his latest book called Hug Your Haters. Um, Jay is a huge influencer in the social media space. He's the most retweeted person among digital marketers. Um, he also publishes the number one content marketing blog and the number one marketing podcast. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to someone I trust and respect, and uh, we hope that this is a really useful Thank webinar you. for you. Um, without further ado, Jay Bear. Thanks so much, Susan. I really appreciate those kind words. Terrific to be with you. So glad to be working again with my friends at Clara Bridge. Today, we're going to talk about hug your haters. Let me just make this a little louder. Uh, look, it doesn't matter what business you're in. If you're selling software uh, the way Susan and her team are, whether you're selling professional services like I am with my team, whether you're selling sandwiches or anything else, eventually, uh, some of your customers are going to have feedback. And, and that's what happened in this circumstance. This was uh, somebody who stayed in a very, very bad motel. It looked a little something like this. This is not an actual photo of the motel, but you get the idea. This is an actual review on TripAdvisor.com. Uh, the headline of this review is, I think I can feel death creeping upon me uh, as I write this, which I think Susan will... Uh, confirm that's what you call in the uh, social media software business uh, a highly negative uh, review uh, when the headline talks about death creeping upon you as I write it. This review goes on to say it's so gross, like something in a horror movie. I'm about to walk out to my car to get my own blankets because this bed is so gross. I don't even want to imagine how many people are brought here to be murdered. Do not stay here. And then my very favorite part. Also, the Wi-Fi blows. Now, that part I think is particularly and deliciously postmodern because this guy, Sean3985789, is without a trace of irony putting murder and Wi-Fi in the same amenity category. They are of equal importance to him, which I think is very postmodern. Now, the natural reaction, if you were this hotel, if you were any sort of business that's taken to task with this level of vigor online, the natural human reaction, of course, would be to ignore this, to dismiss this as the rantings of a crazy person. But that is, in fact, the worst possible thing you can do. Earlier this year, in preparation for this new book, Hug Your Haters, I conducted a massive research project in cooperation uh, with Edison Research, and we surveyed thousands upon thousands of people to discover who complained where they complain, why they complain, and how. And what we discovered was simply remarkable. We found that when you do not answer a complaint, it decreases customer advocacy, always, in all channels. It takes a bad situation, and it makes it worse. Because think about this, not answering somebody's complaint, not answering somebody's negative review, is in fact an answer. It's an answer that says, we don't care about you very much. Now, our research also found that conversely, when you do answer a customer complaint, it increases customer advocacy every time and in every channel. It takes a bad situation and makes it somewhat better. So what this means is that what we should be doing in business is 
hugging our haters. We should understand and acknowledge that haters, the people who complain about us, are not your problem. Rather, ignoring them is. The better approach is to hug those haters. And what that means is that you answer every complaint in every channel, every time. Every complaint, every channel, every time. Instead of what we typically do in business, which is to answer some complaints when we get around to it in the channels that we personally prefer. There are lots of businesses out there, including several businesses owned by personal friends of mine who answer the phone whenever it rings, who answer the email whenever they receive one, but will never ever under any circumstances answer a Yelp review or a Facebook post or a tweet. And that, my friends, is simply crazy. This makes actual business sense on multiple levels. First, hugging your haters helps you keep your customers. As mentioned, it actually increases customer advocacy, and that is not an insignificant opportunity for business. But yet, we, we don't actually run our businesses with this intent. Globally, each year, approximately $500 billion is spent on marketing. At the same time, just $9 billion is spent on customer service, even though everybody on today's webinar, everybody who has ever been in business more than 45 minutes knows the maxim that it is much more cost-effective to keep the customers that you've already earned than it is to go out and have to continuously pay to get new customers over and over and over. We know it makes more sense to retain customers, yet we do not actually operate businesses financially under that condition. And this is despite the fact that multiple research uh, studies, including this one from Harvard Business Review, demonstrate that just a 5% increase in customer retention can yield a profit increase of 25 to 85%. This makes massive financial sense, yet we knowingly, in fact, in some cases, gleefully ignore customer complaints because we either don't agree with the customer or we just simply choose to not participate in that particular channel. Now, you can actually differentiate your company using this principle. One of the organizations that's particularly good at this that might be an unexpected one for you is Discover Card, Discover Financial Services. And about 18 months ago or so, Discover said, look, financial services is uh, super competitive. Uh, you get your MasterCard, you get your visas, you get your American Express. Those guys all do tons and tons of television. Uh, we got to find a way to be different uh, in addition to the kind of cash back thing they've always done. They said, well, what if we just said that we were going to be the most responsive, best customer experience, best customer service company in financial services. What would it take to do that? So they audited their own business. They audited competitors, and they said, here's what we can do. If we can find a way to answer every customer question and every customer complaint within 20 minutes, regardless of channel, phone, email, Yelp, TripAdvisor, SkyWriting, smoke signal, doesn't matter. If we can answer everybody within 20 minutes, that will be a massive competitive differentiator for us. And they put the actual resources necessary to do that. So here's how it works. There's a guy, uh, Rob Especial is his name. I believe he lives in Chicago. So he went on vacation uh, and he did not check his email on vacation. And good for you, Rob. Nice, nice work-life balance, my man. So he gets back from vacation. He checks his email. And he finds that he has not just one, not two, but rather three separate emails from Discover Card saying, hey, Rob, would you like to take out a credit card application? He thought that was a little over the top, so he went to Twitter to complain. Here's what he tweeted. I haven't checked my email in a few days, and there are three offers for the Discover Card. Persistence or lack of coordination? Persistence? or lack of coordination. Now, of course, it would be easy to just ignore that, be like, whatever, dude, just hit delete. Uh, but Discover has decided to differentiate with these principles. They said, now that's what, not what we do. We answer every complaint in every channel, every time, and we do it fast. In this case, they did it in 13 minutes. Here's what they answered back. At Rob Special, we must be excited to have you apply. DM with your full name and full address if you would like the mailings to stop. 
Amy. How about that? They apologize. They give him an opportunity to get off the list. She uses her real name to make it a little bit warmer. All within 13 minutes. Well done. Had a big impact on Rob. He tweeted right back. At Discover, kudos for the prompt response time. Okay, I'll bite. Mostly because of your response, Amy. Hashtag great service. Hashtag great service. Okay, I'll bite. Mostly because of your response, Amy. Here's a guy who specifically went to Twitter to complain, and because Discover was able to get back to him in a kind and quick manner, actually took out a credit card application. They turned a hater into a customer in 13 minutes just by embracing negative feedback. Now, we've always called that historically, right? You might think of it now as a customer service story. And I suppose you could say that's a customer service story, but is it really? I think it's a marketing story. I think it's the future of marketing. It's a series of one-to-one micro interactions like this that cause people to support companies or choose to not support others. The way I see it, customer service and CEM are the new marketing. And this is going to be massively important for us all. Research from Walker Information shows that by 2020, which is a a pretty close period of time from now, by 2020, customer experience will be more important than price. More important than price. How people feel or how you make them feel about transacting and interacting with your business will be more important to those customers than what your stuff costs. Are you ready for a world where this is true? For most businesses, large, small, medium, B2B, B2C, government, doesn't matter. In almost every case, they are ill-prepared for customer experience to be the primary way that consumers decide where to put their money. Now, the other reason this makes sense, in addition to just keeping your customers and generating more profit uh, and being ready for the customer experience-led decision-making, is that hugging your haters, it simply makes you a better company because it gives you information you need to do just that. Haters are the canary in the coal mine. They are the early warning detection system for your business. I I was doing a a, a telephone call with a client earlier this week, and they said, Jay, um, how can we get fewer complaints? And I said, why would you want that? Why would you possibly want fewer complaints? Why would you want to have fewer ways to know what's wrong with your business? Certainly, you want to be a better company and improve your operations. That is all true. But but if you want to have fewer complaints in your business, it's really easy to do that. You know how you do it? Stop listening for complaints. Stop looking for them. Your most important customers are your least happy customers. Because... 95% of dissatisfied customers never take the time to complain in a form or a fashion that the business will find. They may bitch about you to their friends, but they're not going to tell you directly. They're not going to call you. They're not going to email. They're not going to say it to your face. They're not going to tweet. They're not going to Facebook. They're not going to do anything. They just are unhappy and they disappear and they never came back and you never will know why. 95% of negative, unhappy customers. So what that means, the consequences of that are that the haters, the complainers, the people who actually do take the time to tell you what's wrong with your business, what they really are, are the unelected representatives of the much larger and more dangerous group of customers that I call the meh in the middle. That 95% that's dissatisfied but invisible. Recognize that haters, even those who light you up in a very specific and perhaps aggressive way online, those people are quite literally using their time to tell you what you can do better. Customer feedback is the petri dish of operational success. If you want to be a better company, if you want to improve your customer service, if you want to improve your customer experience, Your customers will tell you exactly how to do that. 
you just have to use a tool like ClaraBridge to parse that information and learn those lessons. In fact, ClaraBridge uh, told me a story, Susan and her team told me a story not too long ago when we were together in London uh, about a major, major hotel chain as a customer of Clara Bridges. And uh, they had an issue where uh, people were staying in the hotels and they were saying, geez, I thought this was a non-smoking room, but it smells really smoky in here. Like I think somebody, you know, broke the rules. And, you know, if, if you're, if you're allergic to cigarette smoke or you hate that smell, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to ignore it. I think some of you will, will agree with that. And so they kept having people say, hey, I got to switch rooms. And that's a big operational challenge for the hotel. Hotel couldn't figure it out because it'd been non-smoking for a while. They were almost positive that people weren't illicitly smoking in their rooms. Like, what is the deal? Well, based on this uh, trend that they discovered using ClaraBridge Analytics uh, of telephone calls and emails, they realized that what had happened was that when they switched over from smoking to non-smoking rooms, they did everything except they forgot to change the air filters in the rooms. And that smoke was trapped in the you know $1, $4 filters that were in the air handling units, switched those out, everything was fine. But without really paying major attention to customer feedback, especially negative customer feedback, and without having the opportunity to use something like Clarabridge to, to sort of mine for gold, they never would have found it and never would have been able to handle that issue. Let's talk for a second about haters and, and who they are. I want to introduce to you uh, the Hatrix, which is the analysis of, of who complains and where and why and how. And actually, in my in my new book, Hug Your Haters, there's a poster of the Hatrix in every book that you can actually pull out of the book and put it on your wall and tells you some of these uh, some of these key facts. It's cool to have a book with a poster in it. I'm pretty excited about that. So what we found in the research is that there's actually two main types of complainers, two types of haters, if you will. Uh, the first type of hater uh, are offstage haters. And, and I call them offstage haters because they complain in private. So these are the people who complain on the phone or via email. And they want an answer in almost every case, and they expect one. Uh, these offstage haters are slightly older, they're slightly less social media savvy, uh, slightly less likely to have a smartphone. And over the course of a year, they will complain uh, slightly fewer times because you know you got a call, you got an email. It's a bit of a hassle to do that, um, so there's not quite as many complaints on a per person basis. But these folks want an answer, and they expect one. Nine out of ten, nine out of ten offstage haters expect a reply. Now I'm sure you have experienced this in your own life. If you call a company, you expect them to answer the phone. If you leave a voicemail for a company, you expect that company to return your call. If you email a company, you fully anticipate a, re a return email. It's actually shocking if you don't get one. It may not come as quickly as you like, but it will come in almost every case. It's just part of the social contract. It's, it's how business has evolved that these offstage channels, phone and email, we expect and anticipate a reply. Now, the other type of haters uh, I call onstage haters, and we call them that because they complain in public. So they complain in social media, they complain in review sites, and they complain in discussion boards and forums. And these onstage haters don't necessarily always want an answer. They want an audience, which is why when you read complaints from customers and even your friends online, in many cases, like, oh, this is what happened to me, and they're not necessarily expecting the business to say, oh, can we fix it? What they really want is all their friends to say, oh, that sucks, that's too bad. They're looking for empathy from their peer group. These onstage haters are a little bit younger, uh, more likely to have a smartphone, more likely to be in social media. And because it's easier to complain online, they typically do complain somewhat more often across the course of a year. So fewer than half of these onstage haters actually expect a reply. So if you've got 10 people who are complaining on Facebook, fewer than five of them actually anticipate that the business will answer them at all. Now, this is not a license for companies to ignore onstage haters. It's actually an opportunity for them to answer onstage haters. Because when you do that, you can blow their minds and win their hearts. If somebody complains about your business in social media 
and they don't think you are even listening, when you answer them in 13 minutes, as Discover Card did, it has a disproportionate impact on customer advocacy. It is the number one opportunity to boost customer advocacy, to answer on stage haters. Here's an example uh, from Sarah Jossel. I've forgotten my best friend's birthday. Any brilliant restaurant or bar ideas for this Saturday evening in London? She's just on Twitter, just you know, out there talking. Boom, here's a Hilton Suggests, which is a program from Hilton Hotels. They're paying attention. They just jump in there and say, hey, here's some ideas. Whoa. She's just out there tweeting into the wind, and now Hilton Hotels jumps in there five minutes later and says, I've got some ideas for you. Talk about changing the way you think about Hilton Hotels. Remarkable. Blow their minds, win their hearts. Uh, some of you may know my friend Scott Stratton. Scott's a marketing consultant and author from Toronto, Canada. Uh, when Spotify, the streaming music service, launched in Canada, it was a, a year or so after it launched in the U.S., if I recall, Scott uh, wasn't totally sure what to make of it. And being a very social media guy, instead of calling or emailing Spotify, he, of course, went to Twitter and he sent this tweet. With Spotify being new to Canada... I don't really understand how to use it right, but damn, I like it. So Spotify could have just ignored that, or they could have said, thanks, Scott, we're glad to have you on board. You know, they could have sent some sort of perfunctory copy and paste tweet or ignored it entirely, but they didn't do that. They chose to answer somebody on stage. They chose to blow his mind and win his heart by doing this. They tweeted back a fully customized Spotify playlist at Unmarketing, we're here for you, Scott. Take a look at this. The playlist is, hey, Mr. Scott, welcome to the party. We're here for a good time. So don't worry about a thing. We'll be here when you need us. Just shout and we will come running. Holy crap. What are the chances that Scott is now a Spotify customer for life? Approximately 117%. The most remarkable thing about this story isn't the fact that Spotify did this, although I think that's pretty awesome. It's the fact that in the vast Spotify catalog, there is actually a song with the title of And. How bad of a songwriter do you have to be to be sitting around with your bandmates and say, hey, I've got this great new ballad. We're going to call it And. Now that I'm going to be off the road for the holidays, I'm going to spend some time listening to that song. I, I might have to send this back around in the email that we send after the webinar, send you a link to the song and so that we can all enjoy it. I, I really have no idea what it is or even what genre it is, but maybe we should discover that together, shall we? Now, here's the thing. Today, as we're talking, uh, about two-thirds of all complaints are offstage. About two-thirds of all complaints are private. About two-thirds of all complaints are a combination of phone and email. Your results may vary. This is across hundreds of companies and thousands of people. But that balance, one-third public digital onstage, two-thirds offstage, is changing very, 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 very quickly. In the United Kingdom, complaints about business in social media increased 800% between January of 2014 and May of this year, an 800% increase. That's crazy. And and I mean, it's not it's not surprising necessarily, because think about how much faster, how much easier it is to complain with a smartphone, with an app, as opposed to actually taking the time to call or email. Uh, and this is this trend is going to continue. This genie is not going back in the bottle, friends. I have two uh, two teenagers at home shown here. Uh, my daughter, and my son, it was my son's birthday recently. That's his uh, those are his birthday shoes. And they both have smartphones, of course. Uh, but there is no device in the history of technology that has uh, a, a more inappropriate name than the smartphone. Because of all the functions of that device, the one that they have no interest in whatsoever is the telephone. No interest. They never use the phone. It's impossible to even force them to use the phone. They almost never use email. They use email for like purchase confirmation receipts. That's it. I don't think I've ever ever received an email from my daughter and she's 17. But they'll use 
uh, texting 300 times a day. They use Snapchat the way I eat bacon lustily and greedily. All these different asynchronous communication methodologies they love. And I refuse to believe that at some point they'll be in their early 20s and have a job and say, you know what? I've been thinking and what I've been missing out on are the joys of telephonic communication. I do not believe there's going to be this awakening and they'll say, oh, I've missed out on the phone. So this shift between offstage haters to onstage haters is happening right now. And it has enormous consequences for companies of every size and every type. Now, remember this, every customer has insights that could be critical to your business. And it's your responsibility to unlock those insights. One of my favorite examples is from uh, La Pan Quotidienne. They're a, a, a chain of bakeries and cafes, about 220 locations. They're based in Brussels, Belgium, uh, several locations in the U.S., primarily in the Northeast. And uh, their director of customer experience, Erin Pepper, is really, really smart. And when she started the company, she said that her goal was to double the amount of complaints. Think about that. She wants to double the amount of complaints while still being a better company because she wants to encourage feedback and look for feedback and use tools like ClaraBridge to interpret that feedback and build it back into operations. So she has a great uh, system where she answers all the negative reviews that they get. They don't get a lot of them because they are pretty good at their business, but on occasion they'll get negative reviews on Yelp or TripAdvisor, Urban Spoon or places like that. And she always answers them back in public as you should do. And as I talk about in the book and you know we're terribly sorry and we're gonna fix it and thanks for the feedback. But it's what she does next that's uh, truly interesting. Usually she lets it sit for a couple of hours and then she'll uh, contact the complainer uh, in private. Usually there's a private messaging function on all these different websites. And certainly you can do the same with Facebook or Twitter. And she says, you know, I've been thinking and you are a particularly perceptive customer. You see things that other customers simply do not see. You have a gift. What I'd like you to do your permission, of course, is I'd like to send you two gift cards per month. And I'd like you to use those gift cards to visit a different La Pan Quotidian location. And at the conclusion of your stay, of your visit, I would like you to click this link and fill out this very detailed survey of your experiences. Because you understand what we're trying to do here. And we need people like you to hold us to account to continue to be the great organization that we're trying to be. And it absolutely works. She now has more than 100 of these secret shoppers working for her all over the world, filling out detailed customer experience surveys. Total cost of this program, gift cards. There's lots and lots and lots of uh, specific tips and information, uh, worksheets and playbooks in the Hug Your Haters uh, book, which is uh, can be found at hugyourhaters.com. But a couple of, uh, of quick tips uh, I want to leave you with today. First, I want you to make sure to obey Jay Bear's rule of reply only twice. Never, ever, 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 ever reply more than twice to a customer in public. Because nothing good will come of it and it's a colossal waste of time. If somebody says something positive about your business uh, on a place like Facebook, for example, we love you, you should answer back. We love you too. And if they say, no, we really love you, you can feel free to answer back. No, we really love you. And if they keep at it, just walk away because to acknowledge that further is a waste of time. The more likely scenario, however, is that somebody will be negative about your business and they will say, we hate you. And you say, we're terribly sorry, you must have done something wrong. How can we assist? And they'll say, you can't help me. Your business is too terrible. It's too long gone, whatever. And then you say, clearly there's something amiss. We'd love to talk to you about this in uh, more detail. Can you please call us at or email us at, et cetera. And then when they come back a third time, you just walk away. You never answer a third time because there is no upside. You have, you have addressed it once, you've addressed it twice, you have given them an option or two options of what to do next. And yes, of course, 
we want to try to make that original hater happy, but you can't always do that. We have to recognize instead that online, customer service is a spectator sport. And so, yes, we want to try and make that hater happy, but perhaps more importantly is that you are now on record in front of all the other people who are looking on, and you have stated and shown what kind of business you are and what your values are. You have shown that you listen. You've shown that you care. You've shown that you're willing to uh, address complaints and help people who have negative impressions of your business. But you do not need to go to the mat. You do not need to get into a 14-post back-and-forth flame war shame spiral because nothing good will ever come of that. Customer service is a spectator sport. And when you think about the rise of the on-stage haters, this is going to become more and more and more true. As I mentioned, there's all kinds of other case studies, uh, tons of research, the poster, uh, step-by-step playbooks in Hug Your Haters. The website just launched yesterday, so I'm super excited about that, uh, hugyourhaters.com. 80% of companies say that they deliver exceptional customer service. 8% of their customers agree. I think we have a problem. We all think we're doing great, but yet we are not. But you can do great. You can really differentiate using these principles. You can use customer feedback to create remarkable customer experiences. You can use tools like ClaraBridge and Gager to be better than anybody else in your industry at this kind of customer interaction and I think you'll see that it is absolutely worth the time, the effort, and the resources to do so. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen today. Thanks so much to our friends at Clarebridge, Susan and her team, for putting this together. I'm Jay Bear, and I hope you will hug your haters. Great. Jay, thank you so much for the entertainment as well as the practical advice. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time today with us. So, um, you know, at Clarebridge, we've worked with more than 850 businesses to run their CEM programs, to provide them with the customer analytics from any source, um, process it in a, in a very deep way with uh, the absolute m- most accuracy, and then make it useful to that business. And we also specialize in social customer care solutions. So um, hopefully, as you're watching, Jay, you understand that there are tools out there to help you hug your haters. There are tools and um, that improve your programs. Uh, and with the right ideas internally, um, with advice from people like Jay, you can really be successful with this. It doesn't take a lot of time um, and energy. It just takes the right attitude. So um, with that, um, Jay, there are a few questions that I'd like to turn over to you. Um, let, me, let me start with this one. Um, one of the one of the participants wants to know how do we how do we ensure that we drive towards fewer negative reviews? I kind of alluded to that earlier. I don't know that that's necessarily um, the best metric because if you if your if your metric is how much negativity do we have, it's really easy to meet that benchmark by just listening less aggressively. So I, I don't think having fewer negative reviews uh, is, is necessarily the, the right metric. Um, I think what you should look for is, is to have more customer feedback in general, right? Because every piece of customer feedback is of value. It has, whether it's positive, negative, or neutral, it has some value. So I don't think that's the, the best way to measure any of these kind of initiatives, actually. Right, right. And, and I guess uh, I would add to that the the way to ensure you um, are growing your business and providing the best possible customer experience, um, which, by the way, will drive loyalty, it will increase your revenue, it will decrease your costs, especially in customer service, um, it is to actually listen to those customers in a useful way uh, by dissecting exactly what they're saying, not just at the macro level, like overall this, this review is negative, but at the clause level. They're talking about my service positively, they're talking about my products negatively, then do something about it, but get to that actionable bit of data. Great. Um, so, Jay, can you tell me, why don't all companies 
do it seems like what you're saying is is obvious but why don't all companies hug their haters well, there's a number of reasons for it um some of it is just simply cultural i mean some companies say that they care deeply about customer satisfaction but yet where they invest their resources and and the way they behave and the way they train their people would indicate that that's not in fact the case. You can say, I mean, nobody says, you know what we don't care about is customer service. I mean, nobody says that, right? But but it's clear, it's obvious that some companies care more than others. Uh, and so some of it's simply cultural. Uh, some of it is is resources that they want to hug their haters, but but there's too many uh, too many complaints, or it's going to be too expensive to now uh, to to staff it in multiple places, things like that. So some of it's just a financial resource allocation. But I think the biggest issue right now, Susan, is 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 this off stage to on stage shift that there's. Mm-hmm. You know, companies have had a number of years now, many years, 10 plus years to say, okay, we can answer the phone and we can answer email. But now you've got to answer the phone, you got to answer email and you got to answer Twitter and Facebook and and WhatsApp and WeChat and Instagram and discussion boards and review sites. And so the number of channels, the number of places that you conceivably could or should interact with your customers isn't hasn't grown by 10%, it's grown by 500%. And, and so most organizations simply are not that there yet. They just haven't they just haven't understood how important this is and taken the steps necessary to broaden the places that they will allow customers to interact with them. And and we've just got to get to the point where we say we're going to deal with customers in the places where customers want as opposed to the places where businesses want. Yeah, that's that's amazing and I think great advice. Um when Think about it from a bank's perspective and a financial institution's perspective. There are some compliance rules on um, on recording and documenting complaints, uh, as well as you know how how they respond to them. Um, have you worked with any big banks, and what advice do you have for them on hugging their haters? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, we talk about some of that in the book and some of those regulations and rules. So um, there are a couple of places where where the way you would log complaints are a little tricky today. But, you know, the biggest issue is that even if you can't resolve the issue on that channel, which we call channel switching, um, you can still address it initially, right? So you can say, we hear you now for reasons that are both um, legal and also so protect your own personal financial information. We're going to close the loop on this in a different place. So you can you can listen in more places than you can transact, uh, but that's okay, right? At least you can you can sort of push your service level out to the margins and then bring them back to a more secure, uh, documentable process to actually execute on that. That's the best practice. I mean, it's not it's not it's a little bit of a simplification, but it's not totally different from having a public tweet and then a direct message. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to give you another question. Um, so. Do you have thoughts about how to handle negative comments around something less tangible? And this particular person asks or defines that their company is a data company. And we hear frequently that customers don't like how we source our data or um, the processes to validate the data. So it's 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 you know it's not it's not an Apple Watch. It's not um, whether, you know, the they made their flight on time. It's it's a data company. So. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, um, how to handle negativity in that sort of environment? Yeah, thanks. That's a, a, a great one. Um, so here's how I would do that. And here's how we actually advise corporate clients to do this. Um, I, I mentioned that um, customer feedback is the Petri dish of operational success. And that is very true. And, and then Claire Bridge as a company basically pioneered that principle. But Customer feedback is also the Petri dish of content marketing. Everybody here, either themselves or other parts of their organization, are thinking about how do we create content? What content should we create? What format should we create? Content marketing is exploding this year. 70% of content marketers will create more content than in any other year. 
the best way to think about this is if you're getting those kind of questions consistently from customers, hey, what's the deal with your data sourcing? We're not totally sure that we believe in this. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're not fully bought in. What I would do is create a whole series of explainer videos or blog posts or infographics or podcasts or all of the above that, that actually addresses those questions and those concerns head on. And then when somebody posts that in a, either an offstage or onstage capacity, I would send them the link to that content and say, yeah, lots of people have that question. We've already answered it. Here you go. Yeah, that's perfect. Perfect. Perfect advice. I really appreciate that. Um, another customer or prospect asks, um, how large of a support staff does a large corporation need to monitor all of these social media channels? It's really impossible to say um, because the volume is so dependent on the type of business. Um, if you look at a company like KLM, uh, Royal Dutch Airlines based in Amsterdam, you know they answer 60,000 tweets per week. They have a staff of 100 that, that are just on, on Twitter and Facebook. That's all they do is Twitter and Facebook customer service. Now, that's a, a certainly a pendulum swung far in the other direction. Uh, there, there are other companies that, that can have you know one or two people um, maximum that handle all the social media uh, outlets. It just depends on A, uh, how many channels you're active in, and more is better than less, I think, B, the kind of customer interaction volume that you'll find, uh, C, your internal sort of service level, how fast you believe you should get back to people, uh, and then D, what kind of software you have at your disposal to make that process easier. If you're using something like Engager, which is part of ClearBridge now, that's going to make it a lot easier and faster to cover more ground. Yeah, right. And I, yeah, I would add to that the the last bit is, if you're supporting customers globally, um, so we have organizations that we work with like Airbnb who have uh, used our Engager product to follow, do follow the Sun global support um, of that social channel. And um, so they're in multiple locations. So there's people per location. And um, and then the, the tool is, as Jay mentions, is really critical because the tool is either gonna give you everything and you're gonna have to weed through it yourself or you could use a product like ClaraBridge, which is actually going to, um, very in a very sophisticated manner, filter down to the data that you you need to react to quickly, um, based on your own inter internal priorities, and make it super easy for you to get back to those people um, rapidly. Many of our customers meet their own internal SLAs. Um, and my last advice for that, um, the person asking online would be, um, just get started. Start with one or two people. And that's exactly how KLM started. I saw them present at another social media show. And um, the, the head of their marketing team um, started her social media uh, support channel during the Ash Cloud a few years ago. And uh, she just decided on her own that she had to do something. Um, and then it grew. So um, you, we'd advise, and I think Jay would do the same, uh, figure out a way just to start. This has been wonderful, Jay. Um, thank you so much for your insight, uh, for all your research.